So thank you so much for inviting me to come speak to you today. And I come um, with all sorts of stories I'd like to share with you about my career. Because uh, many times you think in order to become a dean and a vice chancellor, it must have been a slide, right? I just climbed up on top of a slide and just slid right into this job because everything must have gone just perfectly. And that your life won't do that, so you can't be a dean or a vice chancellor. And my goal today is to convince every one of you that you can lead something. We need you to lead something. Like she mentioned this morning, there are very few women in leadership positions. There are only about 18 women deans in the country. I'm a vascular surgeon, and I actually was so excited to be a dean because I thought I'd walk into the room and see at least 30% women, which we know is what you need to feel so that you can participate, you get rid of the stereotypic threat. And I walked in, and there were 13 of us out of 120. Now there are 18 women chairs of surgery in the country, 12 in the last two years, and that's my hobby. I've been picking them out, helping them negotiate, making sure they take the jobs, and now we're doing the leadership job. <laughs> um, and we're, we're doing a leadership conference at the American Surgical because we need more women leaders. And you can do it. And I'm going to, on these slides, I'm going to tell you how to do it. Um, it's just what she said to take risks, walk right up to someone and introduce yourself to someone famous. It's that simple. And once you get to know me or the other people that are in this room, we'll help you do that. Uh, so we'll really want to tell you how much we need you to lead. Uh, and you'll love leading. Uh, you get to make your own decisions, your own schedule. You get to uh, put it in some flexible state that you will like. But you really need to help us lead. And the fact that you're here means you probably want to be a leader. And so we'll teach you how to do that. I really can't. Oh, oh I can see it right there. Good. So I'm going to talk about bloom where you're planted. I gave this talk starting about 10 years ago. Um, this is Mary Engelbright, for those of you that know her, she's a, an artist from St. Louis. I do lots of crafts and those kind of things. And this is one of hers that says, wherever you are, you can accomplish many things and you can have a great life wherever you land and just enjoy it then. And it's, thank you very much. Um, so that's what I'm going to tell you about my life, how I bloomed where I planted. And I just took another new job. I'm going to be uh, president and CEO of Wake Forest Baptist Hospital. Uh, there's only about two or three women. Um, doing that and I'm so excited to go there they just did reverse the bathroom problem yesterday so you all can come visit me <laughs> not quite fixed but they're working on it and the fact that they do have issues in North Carolina is exactly the reason I should go there right uh, so you also need to take those chances great president of Wake Forest he hired me and I was talking to him this morning he's been involved with the governor to get those rules changed. Now, granted, the NCAA tournament is coming next year, and there's a lot of money on the line. So that's probably why they did it. Um, but you'll see also, as a leader, you need to get what you want in many different ways. And so you just listen and pay attention. Um, so how about me? Where did I come from? OK, so it looks like I'm very unstable here. OK, so my, I, went, I grew up in Illinois. I was born in Decatur, Illinois, a small town that's known for soybeans and high flyer kites, for those of us that are a little older, uh, those yellow kites. I went to three grade schools through high schools because my dad was a circulation manager for small newspapers and then for the Chicago Tribune. So I learned very quickly to meet new people and move on and to enjoy new environments. I went to the University of Illinois to become a high school biology teacher. They closed education. I didn't know what to do, so I bloomed where I planted and decided to go into pre-med because to be a nurse, you had to leave your senior year and go to Chicago. I was a Pi Beta Phi and having a grand time in college. I wasn't leaving, so I went pre-med and got into Rush University early decision. The reason I got in early decision was I sat and talked to this wonderful woman who was a histology professor. And Norma Wagner was the dean of students then, and she's in Colorado now. My class in 1980 was 42% women because of Norma Wagner. So the histology professor said, what was the last book you read? And I just read Rabbit Run. And it's all about hierarchy and rabbits, and it was her favorite book. <laughs> so I got in the next day. Um, <laughs> 
so it's those kind of things that serendipity, and here I was in medical school, and I was going to be a pediatrician because that's all I knew. I came from a small town. Nobody was a doctor. I did surgery first to get it out of the way, and I loved it. And because I'm really good with my hands, I do crafts, I sew, my dad's a woodworker and all that, and so was my mom, a, a, a seamstress. I love surgery. So I went into surgery and became a vascular surgeon and trained at UCLA. Um, that year, there were three women in our uh, intern class of uh, 28. That was three more than they'd ever seen. Um, I was the sixth woman to finish that program, the second woman to finish vascular. And I was only the sixth woman in the country to get a certificate in vascular surgery. And I am one of the two oldest vascular surgeons in the country that are women right now. One is Linda Riley, who practices at UCSF. Um, and, but now, when I go talk to the fellowship class, it's about 48% women going into vascular surgery. So big changes. So my career, what was it? I have a very reactive career, and many women do, uh, just according to what you need to do for your family, your friends, and yourself. But since I'd moved so much as a kid, this was no brainer. I could go anywhere, right? And I really would encourage you just to dream big and just jump. So off I went to get my first job at San Diego, mainly because my first husband was an oncology fellow, and he took his fellowship there. So we went there for two years. I moved back to UCLA, and we ended up getting divorced. And at that time, we actually went to see a therapist to see what we could do. We had been married for seven years. And he looked at me, and he said, you know, if you just give up surgery, if you just give up surgery, this is going to work out really well. And so he left, and Jane, my therapist, <laughs> looked at me and she goes, you know, Julie, you really need to get rid of him. And I did. Uh, and so, uh, and it, it was really tough. So for those of us that had been divorced, it's really tough, but it was such the right thing to do because the solution wasn't to give up surgery. The solution was give up him, you know, and so you're going to have to make those decisions. And I ended up marrying Phil now. We've been married 24 years. I met him through a dating service back when it wasn't like popular, you know, to do it. I was in Milwaukee. Um, but it was one of the best decisions I made. It was hard to tell my students in residence though I had failed, right? That here I'm supposed to be the one showing balance and goodness. But, you know, Jane, I'll always love Jane when she said, you know what? You need to get rid of him. And, and, and off I went then to become, um, uh, I went to Wisconsin, so I moved and spent six years there. That's where I met my husband and had my son, uh, who's now graduating from the University of Maryland. And my husband had uh, two kids uh, from his first marriage as well, so I'm a proud stepmother. One lives here in Berkeley, and they just had their second child. And so I just saw Felix. He's three days old last night. Um, Felix and Zoe. That daughter-in-law believes in home births. Uh, I don't. Uh, <laughs> But here we go. I, I did not attend the births, but uh, good luck. And she, uh, it's Berkeley, you know. And so, and, um, and the other stepson lives in Los Angeles and is married to Michelle. And they had their baby at UCLA Medical Center. And so I was there. So, uh, so I met them there and had a great career there for six years. I had a great senior partner. Uh, when I interviewed there, again, they'd never seen a woman vascular surgeon, and in my first job, when I showed up to my first case, I'm in the back of the room in San Diego, and they said, I wonder what the surgeon's going to look like, what he's, is he like? He, I was the first woman surgeon on staff at UCLA and UCSD, so in Milwaukee, I was number two, but when I was interviewing with him, he goes, you know, you just don't remind me of a girl. And I was like, OK, what does he mean? Because we're really good friends. Because you don't make me nervous. You seem like you know what to do. I can be your partner. And so after that, we were fast friends. So the other thing is always ask what they mean. Because sometimes they're trying to tell you something nice, but it comes out <laughs> a little bit different. So then I was tapped to go back to UCLA, where I trained to be a division chief. So I was division chief of Vasker for five years, and actually was over the people that trained me, which gave me a lot of skill sets. Uh, also, raising stepkids give you lots of skill sets for those of us that have done that, especially with a conditional mother and interesting things. But off we go, and then also learning to lead those that trained you. 
because many of you will have that opportunity and need to learn that that's okay too, that it's your time, it's your turn that you can do that. And then I got tapped to go be a chair of Johns Hopkins. And, and the reason this was so significant um, is I was only the sixth chair ever, um, first woman ever. And for my 11 years there, I was the only woman chair of anything, of anything at Johns Hopkins. And look at those years. That's 2003 to 2014. I was the only woman chair. Uh, they're great guys, wonderful people. I did ask them, if you knew you had to go to a dinner with 18 women, would you go? And they said, no. <laughs> but I went with them all the time, and that was my, my job, was to bring that other uh, position. Now, there are three women chairs at Hopkins, not of surgery. My uh, successor is an African-American man who took the job, and he was the first African-American man as well to be chair at Hopkins, but there's a chair of pediatrics, anesthesia, uh, and, and hopefully one in radiology who's interim. But uh, again, this leadership thing is really important to understand that when you get to be a leader, uh, that you actually can change the world. You can want to change the world at your level, and you can tell us what you feel and what you need, and we'll listen to you. But the world doesn't change uh, till you're in charge. And, and you have to be in charge. Now, you can influence those who are your leaders, and many people listen. And I've had tons of great mentors that are both men and women who have listened and made it different. But true change only occurs when you go in and be in charge, when you've got a different agenda and a different style. When I was at Johns Hopkins, everybody watched me, everything I did. And I wear a little color, as you know, and, and I wore black for a year because I just couldn't take it anymore. They would comment on my dress, what I said, where I was. Was I in the operating room? Was I traveling too much? Was I here? Was I there? You really have to get above that fray of being watched, being judged, and just go do the right thing. Because if you always do the right thing, you know, by your patience, by your people, if you never lie and tell the truth and use integrity as your tool, especially as you get older, you can't remember what you say, so you always tell the truth. <laughs> um, but just always be that truthful person. And when I left Hopkins, they made a video, and so for your young people, it's a YouTube out there. If you type in my name, and they paint your portrait at these places, so I have this portrait that they painted. Um, and they painted it and videoed me. I didn't know, I of course got the first woman painter to paint me, and she's going to paint my portrait at Davis too. Um, that they said the two things I did was to have your back and make you better. And that's what leaders do, and you can do that. You do that every day. You have your friends back, you have your kids back, and you make people a little better. So as you leave someplace, they really don't want you to go, because at Davis they don't want me to go because I'm leaving. They can list two or three things that maybe you made it better, even as a student or a resident. And if asked to bring you back, they go, yes. And the last thing is they have the party for you before you leave and not after you're gone, you know? Because I know there's many people, I have parties after they're gone. Um, <laughs> but you want to have your party before so they can thank you. So pull up that video, because it's actually a, a bunch of male surgeons talking about work-life balance, using quotes, talking about what I, I had them do, and cultural change, which took a long time. Now, Davis, I've been there three years. We've actually done a lot of work with strategic planning, really getting us loud and proud, making it happen. And the main reason I'm going back east, it's, it's a bigger job uh, to be the CEO of Wake Forest. It's a bigger hospital, bigger system. But my son took a job in Maryland, and I miss him a lot, even though I've got some grandkids on this side. So it's a great big job. Again, another reason to influence change. They never had a woman run Wake Forest Baptist Medical Center. I'm replacing a, a, a man who's been there eight years, not as effective with people and cultural change, and the president of Wake Forest wants cultural change, and, and that's what he wants to have happen. So that's where I choose my leadership positions. So I leave in a month, uh, and I'll be moving to uh, Winston-Salem, and we're um, really looking at how to deliver health care in that rural part of North Carolina, as well as continue academics and innovation, and doing partnerships so we can take care of all the uninsured in North Carolina, which is 15%, as well as Medi-Cal patients, which are about 4 million. And we've been doing the same thing in California, looking at our 
15 million Medi-Cal patients, half our children in California are on Medi-Cal, and we're actually making some progress with reimbursement for uh, those in Southern California, hopefully soon in Northern California. So even if you have health insurance, it's actually affordable and people will see you because they're adequately paid. So what about lessons learned? So what, what have I learned? Um, I think for me, and maybe for you too, you really need a flexible pace. When people ask me, what are those things that you regret or things you wish you'd done? I actually had a breakfast meeting, for those of you who saw me, I was out there with a woman who runs a board I'm on, whose husband had a cardiac arrest and had survived it but isn't quite well, and she's trying to run our board and she's been criticized by our new board person, and we were talking about what can you do to, to make her more effective. And part of it, she needs a little flexible pace. You know, her husband almost died, and, and here we are trying to go forward. I've known her for three years. And, and part of it is really supporting women in a way uh, that you can make that happen. Uh, one thing, if you are on a board with her, it's her and me and a couple other guys, and, um, is when a woman says something on a board, frequently they don't listen to us. Uh, and if we have gray hair, they really don't listen to us, unlike men where they listen to gray-haired men, and that's a fact, okay? I have a great hairdresser, okay? Um, <laughs> I got gray hair at 32, um, probably all that surgery. And what, I, what you do is you reiterate or restate what that woman just said. So if you're on a board or somewhere and your friend says something, and then somebody else, usually a guy, says it again, they go, oh, what a smart man. You go, oh my god, no, Libby said that. So what I'm going to do with Wendy is we're really going to reinforce her position on the board. You need to admit you're wrong. I, I make mistakes all the time, usually not big ones. You know, I'm still a surgeon, I still operate, I don't make mistakes in my operating room, don't worry about that. But when you make a bad decision or you really say something you really regret or you put a team together and they're not affected, just say you did it, you know, that was wrong. Let's, let's reboot and go forward. It's really powerful to see a leader say they're wrong. Right now we're seeing a leader that says he's never wrong, you know. <laughs> I don't know what happened with the Accountable Care Act last week. I mean, it was, it was almost never just going to go build a wall because, you know, health care is complicated. You know, I was like, whoa. Um, uh, but you need to admit you're wrong, you know, and, and then say, what can we do? And I do ask for questions and answers from people all around me. You never can listen too much. I'm a talker. I'm an extrovert. If you, I take all those tests, and I'm an E over the cliff, you know, to die. Mainly it's because when I was little, we moved so much. I can meet you in a nanosecond. I'll tell you stories. I can do this. That's just who I am. That may not be you. But I need to listen. So when I, I came to Davis, I went, had all the departments and divisions give me um, a symposium of four hours of young people, the research academia. When I was talking to the president of Wake Forest this morning, we're going to do the same thing there so we can learn about what makes people tick. Why do they come to work every day? You know, some people do come to work every day and cause endless trouble and go home, but most people come to work to do something amazing. And as you go through your career, you know, why do you come to work? Is it to do research, do clinical work? Is it to teach? Right now, mine is to develop young people into leaders. I said yes to this because I want want all of you to be leaders and someday 20 years from now you're going to say she told me to do that and then I know I accomplished what I wanted to do today. You also need to be yourself as soon as possible in these leadership roles. You will find yourself trying to sort of um, fit in and make sure they listen to you. I'm on a board, I was just talking to Sandra, of all the UC deans and all the UC CEOs, and there is a culture there uh, which needs to be changed, and you need to raise your hand, and you need to say your piece. You need to tell them, because the reason you're there is to give them that opinion. So you need to be yourself. You need to, that first year I wore black at Hopkins, I said, screw that. I'm going to wear whatever I want, say, because that's why they brought me. And there is an article there about, after a few years, I thought, I'm never going to move this place. And the head of faculty affairs said, Julie, we brought you here to, to give us a different opinion, so please do that. I find sense of humor invaluable. I've got a really great one, I think, to do it. It really keeps me bouncing. You could imagine, I trained in surgery in the 80s. Every other night in hospital, 
Um, you know, it was really tough trying to get your cases. I went into vascular surgery, which was a new sport then, lots of death and dying. It was a tough thing, and you have to keep going. You know, people are going to say weird things. People are going to um, uh, uh, really question your abilities. You really need to have that sense of humor, that ability to get along, and people should be glad to see you. You shouldn't be that person that's the Debbie Downer that always goes, oh, you need to really figure out how you're going to flavor your life so you're one of people's favorite people. You have to enjoy it along the way. One of my mentors, Dr. Wilson, said that this could be it. I mean, this could be the best job you got. You know, or, and for those of you that are spiritual, this could be heaven. You know, the, it, where we're going could be worse. And so enjoy it right now, because lucky us, we get to be physicians. We get to take care of people. We get to discover. We get to teach. And if you're doing half the day time things you love in your job, that's a really good job. Dr. Stabile taught me that. And those complaining, those are really, really important people. Dr. Yuki is my brother-in-law at Greenville, South Carolina. <laughs> That's job security. They come in and complain. You get to fix things. You do need to keep your family in the loop, and I think I've done a really good job of that. Similarly, you heard me. I went to see my grandson last night, and then I took a lift over to Burlingame because my sister-in-law was here. My father just recently died, and so she had been involved with that, and me too. And so we got together with her sisters, and then tonight I'm flying out to um, Orlando to talk at the Women in Surgery program down there and staying with a really good friend. So do that. All those things, it sounds exhausting, doesn't it? But it was wonderful to do them. And then the other thing I've learned is any crisis actually gives you an opportunity to change the world. And Dr. Pizarro taught me that. And so when you look at something, don't let a good disaster pass you by. Because if there's a big disaster, people are going to be looking for a solution. And that you can do as a leader and turn the boat really fast. So any disaster you have, take that. Make it different. Make it better. Make it work better. Bring it to the surface. Use those things to mobilize change. And then people then will see that change is a good thing. So diversity, you're going to talk a lot about this at your meeting today. And, and I'm not going to stay because I'm going down to this other one. But I think diversity is the key to success. The thing that I've done when I put teams together, I think of them as a mosaic. That when you put a team together, everyone should look different, whether it's skin color, gender, gender preference, whether it's where they trained or taught. At Hopkins, we never hired anybody except from five schools when I got there. I said, do you think there's anybody good at Oregon or UCSF? No. You know, it was, you know, it was only Harvard, Vanderbilt. So we actually took somebody from you know, the University of Washington. They thought I would have, they were in shock. You know, that the, so part of it is it can be anything as you put a mosaic together, because backgrounds uh, are really important to put teams together. And this is something you need to manage. It's not a diversity officer. It's not a program. One of my themes at Davis was diversity and inclusion for the year. But it's got to be a competency. And, and you all probably have some of it. But we all have implicit bias. And if you haven't taken implicit bias training, you need to. Because most of us are white preferential, because we know whites tend to get more stuff and tend to be more accomplished and get more roles. So we tend to all have a little white preferential bias. And you need to know what that looks like so that you can lead in a more effective way. So this is my son. Uh, Taylor's big. He's six foot four. He's an equity uh, manager. Uh, of uh, got a great job in Baltimore. That's my husband, Phil, and we're in Hilton Head. And he wrote um, an essay called uh, Wearing Different Hats. So if you put my name in and get Wearing Different Hats, this is his essay to get into college. And he talked about how I taught him to wear different hats, that either I was at his basketball game or I was being a chair of surgery, and there were weird people in our house having dinner and dignitaries. He goes, but that's what my mom told me. And he wrote this. He wrote as she went up the ladder, she faced more bias. He wrote this, that my mom broke the mold of the traditional woman. I didn't tell him to write this. He wrote this. <laughs> and he went against the grain, became the first woman. And my mom gets that every day from her family and the will and drive to make it happen. When my dad died uh, last week after about a five-week illness, my son, 21 years old, is the one who called and said, because I was making all the healthcare decisions with my dad in Atlanta, he said, how are you? 
And I said, I'm okay. He goes, you know, sometimes we forget to ask the people in charge how they are. He's 21. I mean, I raised a great guy. Yeah. And he did ask me when he was six, you know, can boys be surgeons too? And I almost said, I almost said no. <laughs> but I said, you know, with your mom's help, we can get that done. So you are going to be the hero of your own story. You know, mine's been complicated. You heard today I've been divorced. You know, my dad recently died. I've had multiple jobs. I've had stepkids. This will be you. This will be your story. But you're going to be that hero and enjoy every minute along the way because it's been great. And I'm still not done. I've been a surgeon now for 30 years, and I think I still got about five or ten more uh, to help bring you to wherever you want to be. Uh, but enjoy it. Be a leader. We need you to lead. There aren't many good choices of leaders. I told my kids at Berkeley who are Bernie people, OK, you didn't like any of our choices. Go run for office. You know, go do something. Make it better. I'll vote for you. You know, just tell me, but go, go lead. And the, you'll find such joy in leading. And this is my last picture. We all went to Hawaii this year. So that's Matt and Michelle with Milo, who's a little sleepy. That's Gretchen, who just had Felix, and Paul and Zoe, who I just saw. Taylor, who's the tall one on the right, and my husband and I. Um, do that. Spend time with your family. Go lead and have a wonderful life. Thank you.